What's going on, quitters? It's another episode of Don't Quit Your Day Job. Today is April 25th, 2021, and me, your host, Maxim Allen, I just got back yesterday from an 800-mile drive. Pro tip, if you want to drive from Savannah, Georgia to New York City, make sure there's one more than one person in the car that can drive. It's uh, not safe, especially when you get to the East Coast toll roads at night. It's not good. <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, I have a very special guest for you today. Our guest is a Boston comedian, jujitsu guy, and also strongman. Please welcome Peter Liu. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Max. Uh, I don't know if I can qualify as a strong man yet, but I don't know about any of those titles, really. But I'll, I'll take them. I'll take them. <laughs> They'll take all of them. Yeah, no, I, I like uh, looking at your Instagram. I'm like, this this is a comedian who could probably beat up 95 percent of other comedians. <laughs> to be fair, I feel like most of the population could beat up 95, if not 99 percent of comedians. <laughs> You're a pretty uh pretty high percentile there then. You're pushing like the ni- you're you're pushing like four nines, like ninety nine point nine nine percent. Yeah, yeah. This is uh this is the eight hundred on the SATs, that's what that is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well thanks for coming on. Um so you in addition to like comedy, we're gonna talk this episode about jujitsu. So what for for people who don't know, what is jujitsu? Oh, this is um, what is jiu-jitsu? Uh, jiu-jitsu is a martial art. It's uh, historically, it comes from Japan, uh, but modern jiu-jitsu is Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mm-hmm. uh, or at least that's usually the jiu-jitsu people refer to. It's the ground grappling, which was, yeah. uh, uh, I would say, uh, the, the, the Brazilians, the Japanese brought jiu-jitsu to Brazil, and the Brazils focus on the ground portion of the grappling, which would they then renamed after themselves, right? The Gracies, it's called Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Wow. And then later on became more Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as a more widespread. But it focused mostly on the ground fighting aspect as opposed to right. the original Jiu Jitsu, which encompassed, uh, like Japanese Jiu Jitsu actually encompasses striking as well. And then, mm-hmm. and then there was another split and it was grappling, but there was judo involved, so there was still throwing. But Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, at least in the modern context, is purely grappling on the ground. Uh, what they call Neiwaza Judo, and it focuses on fighting on the ground with the premise that most fights typically end up on the ground, and therefore you should learn to fight on the ground. So I think that's the overall premise. I learned so much in 30 seconds just here. I was expecting you to just be like, you know, it's kind of like wrestling. I didn't expect a whole history lesson, so that's (laughs) dope. (laughs) So uh, how, like, um, I guess what I usually ask people to start off is like, where are you from? And like, what was your first exposure to this thing? Like, when when did you first, did you, did you, were you into martial arts at all as a kid? Were you en- enrolled in any other martial arts? When did you kind of, when are the seeds of you getting into jujitsu? Sure. Um, I think as a kid, I wanted to do martial arts, but my parents mm-hmm. never wanted me to. So I didn't like do anything. Okay. I watched a lot of Jackie Chan movies though. That was my shit. Nice. Like, I, I Jackie Chan movies. So I would just like imitate what he would be doing on my mm-hmm. free time. And then my parents would be like, go study or something. Um, <laughs> and then I think the first actual martial art I did with like an actual teacher was uh, mm-hmm. was Aikido. I don't know if you've heard of Aikido. I have not. Okay. it's uh, It doesn't work, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, do, you learn to fall very well in Aikido. Uh, Aikido, oh, okay. they, they had a similar philosophy. It was like, use the bigger person's energy against them. Uh, Morihei Ueshiba was the guy who came up with it. And I think it was much more useful in the samurai days when people would take like giant swings at you and then mm-hmm. you can like redirect that energy. But gotcha. in, in, in modern fighting, no one kind of comes at you with like a blow. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> I think the other major flaw of, of Aikido is that uh, because no one taught you how to strike, we're learning how to defend strikes from a bunch of people who don't know how to strike, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. There's an inherent flaw where it's like, oh, we only self-defend, we don't hit people. And then it's like, right. all right, so how do you know you're hitting people correctly for us to do this move that you keep t- teaching us? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> major flaw. I, yeah. I, but again, it was, uh, it was a good introduction. It teaches you how to roll, like uh, mm-hmm. brain falling. So yeah. Rolling on the ground without hurting yourself. Ooh, falling. That's a, big that's a good skill. Yep. How, how old were you when you got into this? 
Uh, this was, uh, I was like, uh, I think probably like 12. 13, okay. Those are, those are like peak falling years. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> peak falling years. Yeah. This is, uh, this is, uh, in New Zealand back then. Mm. Like 12. But, um, Whoa, you, you were in New Zealand at the time? Yes, I was in New Whoa, Zealand at the time. That's dope. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I lived in New Zealand for a bit. I lived in Australia for a bit. I was born in China, and then eventually I made my way here. So, okay, gotcha. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So in uh, Aikido, how long did you stick with that? Uh, like two years. I did that for two years. I learned how to mm-hmm. roll for two years. None of the moves work, again. Like, they teach you <laughs> Nikyo, Nikyo, Sankyo, which in Japanese means like first day, second day, third day. They name right. the moves after the days that you learn them. And they're mm-hmm. like, when you get Ikkyo down, it'll take years to master. Uh, and here, here's the main problem with Ikkyo. Ikkyo is this move that you do when someone grabs a cross grip on your wrist. So okay. it requires me to grab your right hand with my right hand. <laughs> now, if you don't do that, th- there's no ikkyo. That's it. It's, it's done. <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, I was like, because like, I learned the move. And then like afterwards, I went to all my friends. I was like, yo, grab my wrist. See what happens. See what happens when you grab my wrist. And they're just like, no, I don't want to grab your wrist. Like, Why would I do that? And you're like, you know, you make a good point. This probably never happens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh uh nikyo is a similar move similar scenario different move sankyo now see this is where they switch it up because we, we both have two hands right i can grab right. your right hand with my right hand or i can grab your right hand with my left hand yeah so you gotta have a move for both both grabs so okay they, they teach you the other iteration but even that i'm just like people don't tend to just grab people by the wrists. That it doesn't much. really happen. Like it if anything, really you, someone would grab you by the wrist if you were attacking them with like a knife. Like yes. if you were already on the offensive there. Yeah, it, <laughs> it would be like an up catch at that point. But like yeah. if you were just like sitting, both sitting, and I just like reach out and cross grip you, you just be like, "What are you doing?" Like, this, yeah, this is an ineffective way of attacking me. Why don't you just hit me in the face? Like you know. <laughs> uh, so that was my experience wow. with Aikido. So is there in that in like, is there like a ranking system? Like, okay, so when I was a kid, I did karate, you know, you get the belts or whatever. Is there was there like a ranking system in Aikido as well? I think we stayed all as white belts until you get your black belt. But there probably was I don't know. This was like, (laughs) part of school. And we had like a sensei who was like a who was a student. He was just like an upperclassman student. Like it was was Mm. New Zealand. So it's like, uh, like I said, it's like they have forms. Like It's like boarding school. Okay. It's like grammar school is what it is. But okay. Uh, it, it, the difference is like, you know how you have like high school, middle school, or junior, or whatever the crap it is. There, yeah. the all se- you have seven years of schooling all in one school. Mm-hmm. So the youngest people relative to the oldest people is like seven years. Like okay. 11 wow. to 18, right? So like, mm. it was like some 18 year old kid teaching a bunch of like 11, 12 year olds how gotcha. to grab people by their wrists. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably i don't know maybe it's a little important they're like we're teaching you this specifically so you don't let the other kids like bully you <laughs> yeah but only in a certain way right yeah like if, they, if they try to bully you in any other manner you're still screwed uh, <laughs> but, so uh, what was your uh what was the next martial art after that after that uh i actually uh, i did i think i on my own i did like I just like kind of like did stuff until I started doing wushu, which was in uh, in, uh, in grad school. I started doing wushu. I mean, okay. Wushu is like fancy kung fu that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> you'll see there's a, there's a pattern of me doing a lot of things that don't work until I get to the part where I do stuff that actually works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but wushu is um, what is wushu? Wushu is a is a conglomeration of all the different types of Chinese martial arts. Okay. And what they do is they made them, they took out everything that was remotely effective, and then okay. they spiced up all the acrobatic and gymnastics portion of it. So, okay. <laughs> visually, very appealing. Visually, yeah. very appealing. Uh, practically useless, completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's like, uh, you can like watch video. There was in the uh, Beijing Olympics, it was an Olympic sport for like a year. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's very like acrobatic, gymnastic y, you know, a lot of jumping, like things you wouldn't do in a fight, but like it looks very nice. It looks right. Very nice. 
performance. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a movie or a performance thing. Yeah, it's great yeah. for like for movies, wonderful. Like it looks very flashy, it looks very cool. Uh they for performances, like if you see people do mm-hmm. demonstrations and stuff, like it's all that stuff's like very Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's so uh, what what drew you to this one over any other type of sport at that time? Uh, I was like, oh, it's like a Chinese thing, right? I should do the thing that I am. And then okay. uh, there's that. <laughs> and I think, I don't know, it was like, oh, like, this is, I can learn all the Chinese stuff in one, right? And, yeah. then, and then they're like, yeah, you know that none of this actually does anything. And I'm like, oh, shit, damn. Because <laughs> I think I remember going through that period where like I, I did enough wushu and then I went back and watched a lot of martial arts movies. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, like, it kind of like uh, takes away a little bit from it because right, you uh, you can see that like a lot of the strikes were never gonna hit the other person in the mm-hmm. first place. Like you know how in those old school kung fu movies, one guy would be like, and then the other yeah. guy will do, and then you have the situation where they like like cross wrists or you know like they hit each other, but yeah. their faces are both like so far away that the initial strike was only ever gonna hit their arm at best, right? Right. Like, there was no need for him to block his arm with your arm if it's like out here. You know what I mean? Like you right. could have simply done nothing and it would have been fine. Yeah. Uh, but it yeah. it's like uh you ever watch those clips? Uh like people will like take the lightsaber battles from Star Wars and play them like forward reverse, kinda like a boomerang, and they're like, You can see that they are not even trying to hit each other. Yes, they're just yes. like it's just a light show. <laughs> that's that's actually exactly uh they use Wushu to do all the fancy lightsabers. Oh really? That's, interesting most, most movie choreographies of fight scenes come from like some wushu backgrounded person who gets into action cinema like i said it's great for the, the screens mm-hmm. like it looks great it's fancy uh but you know it's not how real fighting would be yeah. at all how, yeah how long did you uh how long were you in wushu uh i did that for about like two years uh and then i segue there's actually another portion of wushu they they mm-hmm. They put it together, even though they have nothing to do with each other. But uh, the other aspect of Wushu is uh, Sancho, or Sanda. Uh, okay. And what that is, is that's like a Chinese form of kickboxing. Uh, okay. It was invented somewhere around the 70s or the 60s. Basically, a bunch of Chinese people went to like Thailand, got their ass beat by, by the Thai fighters, and they come out like, I've got to do something about this. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, they came up with a... That's actually one of the things that I chat with my martial arts friends about a lot. It's like, how did... Because a lot of martial arts come from China originally, right? Mm-hmm. And, and yet, modern day, uh, a lot of Chinese like kung fu stuff is like more just like flowery for show, not mm-hmm. really useful. And it's like, where down the line did that break down, like to like becoming useless? Because I know there's right. there's a bunch of revolutions along the way in history where like it was banned, so you have to mm-hmm. like like oh this is for performance, so they took out a bunch of useless stuff. I mean useful stuff made it useless, right? But. Uh, it's like it's like a uh, tai chi where they're like, oh, tai chi is like the the base of like tons of martial arts, but like tai chi itself is just like for like stretching and meditation and just like exercise. You yeah, know? it's like what old people do in the park. Is what yeah, it's. exactly. It's for circulation, right? <laughs> yeah. So, that's, that's... <laughs> it's like uh, it's like the the de-weaponizing of it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's just old people health exercise. It's it's, <laughs> it's like slow yoga. I mean, yoga is already slow, so I guess it's just Chinese yoga at that point. <laughs> that is interesting. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's someone who's like written their whole like PhD thesis on that. It's like, when did martial arts become useless? <laughs> yeah. 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 But so yeah, sanda is like Chinese kickboxing. Best way mm-hmm. that I can expre- explain it is if you're familiar with Muay Thai or regular kickboxing, mm-hmm. you can punch, you can kick. Uh, professionally, I think they added knees and elbows. The rules might have changed, uh, but yeah, uh, they fight on a lay tie. So if you fall off the lay tie, which you like lose a point, or if you fall twice, you might lose forever. What is that? Is that like a ring or like a platform? It's a square platform that's like okay. elevated a couple feet off the ground. Uh, gotcha. But it's essentially kickboxing. So yeah. uh, because there's gloves, there's the stuff, there's the equipment. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's practically useful. It's like they teach it in the Chinese army, basically. Yeah. So I started doing that Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, I was uh, in San Francisco for a summer. So I started doing it at a school mm-hmm. there. And uh, it was good. I like I, I, I like learned Sancho. And then one day they had like a MMA sparring. Mm-hmm. And I, I like I just like kind of hopped in. Uh, without my coach's consent 
Um, <laughs> he was like, I got to watch out for my fighters today. Like, I can't be looking out for you. I'll be like, don't worry, man. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And uh, he clearly <laughs> didn't like that. So I think he secretly gave a signal to the fighters to fuck me up. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I got, like, pretty destroyed on that first day. Yeah. Uh, I was used to the Sancho at that point. So I was used to, like, so in Sancho, if you catch me and you, we go to the ground, you stop. Just like most right. stand-up fights, like boxing, right? Mm-hmm. Some guy hits the ground, you stop, you, like, reset or whatever. Right. Uh, but this was an MMA sparring day. So, like, a guy caught my kick, took me down. Uh, Snapped your me. arm. <laughs> Not yet. So, first what he did is he mounted me. He started just wailing on me on my face. And then yeah. that, that's when I realized being on the ground is a, is a shitty position. It's a crappy mm-hmm. predicament because, like, you block your face from the front, they hit your face from the side. You block your face from the side, they hit your face from your front. So yeah. then you do like this mixture of both and then they armbar you, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> so, Checkmate. Yeah, exactly. So I experienced that. I was like, huh, maybe there's more to this jujitsu bullshit than that initially thought. Were you kind of like initially kind of opposed to it or like not yeah, really into the yeah. idea? I think I was like in that old school, like, well, it's just like most people. I think in general, when they see like two dudes like, hump each other to the ground. They're like, what is that? That's not fighting. What is that? Yeah. Like, when do I get all of this? Like, this, this is ridiculous. Um, but then, like, you feel it out, and you're like, oh, wow, this is terrible positioning. Like, I gotta <laughs> figure out how to get out of here. And, like, yeah. I think most people don't spend their time on the ground, as they shouldn't. Like, it's not a normal thing to be doing. Right, The only right. time in our lives as, as humans that you're in this, like, supine position is, like, you're going to sleep. Right. Right, that's like yeah, the yeah. only time where you're like lying down like that, or mm-hmm. you're having sex, one or the other. Right? Yeah. <laughs> or third, you're doing jujitsu. You do jujitsu, but yeah, it's like <laughs> it's not a natural position to be in. So you're like right. don't know how to move there. It's mm-hmm. like the ground forces you. It makes it's a barrier, right? So you have to learn how to like maneuver your body, and it's not a uh, it's not natural. But, right. Uh, I think the advantage jujitsu has is that ground fighters spend a lot of time on the ground so they understand what they're doing mm-hmm. um, and being on the ground you can take away a lot of a person's explosiveness which uh, right. everyone comes from the hips so if you're mm-hmm. very athletic it's like it's your hip movement that's like your your body's really just a hinge when your hip is is the hinge right so uh if you take away as a person ability to be explosive and they don't know what they're doing take the ground now you have an advantage mm. and i think that's where the positional dominance of jiu-jitsu comes from it comes from the understanding of these mechanics and, and and being able to like actually quell a person's athletic ability mm-hmm. strength whatever blah 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 blah. Um, yeah so it so let's okay quick question so before you get your ass whooped at this uh, <laughs> this <laughs> this competition day or whatever what what were the aspects of martial arts that you found yourself most into like was there like a specific like type of fighting or do you just like the competitiveness or like what kind of drew you in at that point before you kind of got into the jujitsu aspect uh i think one component is just i don't know i think if you followed it it's like the way i did, did it was like oh this stuff looks cool it's just mm-hmm. like, right so that was like the flashy stuff it's like oh, yeah. yeah i want to be able to do that like, <laughs> let me kick ass like jack chan that's great and yeah and past that it was like uh, like for self defense purposes, it mm-hmm. would be nice, right? So it's just like learning how to be able to defend yourself. So people don't fuck with you, right? Like as a yeah, kid, just like people like like to fuck with you. Like all right, fuck you. Um, yeah. So there's that, and then more recently, I think the the stuff that I, I just like, I really like the technical nature of jujitsu. Like jujitsu. Okay. The difference between jujitsu and striking, and I, I like striking too, is that uh, even though you're choking each other, you're trying to break each other's mm-hmm. limbs. Uh, mm-hmm there is you can it's still much it's it's slowed down relative to striking nothing can really go catastrophically wrong that quickly Mm -hmm. so if you're technical about it and you really study it you can like jujitsu is one of those few things where you actually can that whole idea of like a smaller person being able to over overpower or 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 like uh beat a larger person that's actually you can actually do that still with jujitsu like uh, it's, it's still slowing down nowadays in competition because ev- if everyone knows jiu-jitsu then obviously the bigger person is still going to win right. right? bigger more athletic whatever but uh, jiu-jitsu is one of those last martial arts that still has like open class like absolute competition where you can uh, you know, there's like 
like open weight class. So like you can see a tiny okay. person actually fight a giant person versus like, I think in a lot of other martial arts, uh, because they don't have that, uh, the mechanical advantages, like all, mm-hmm. all the things I listed before, it, it's a lot harder for, uh, a, a smaller person to win. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's like you can you can offset your weight disadvantage with like technical know how yes, with yes. like predicting moves and feeling it out as it's happening and what, what to do in those situations. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I would say so like technique is ultimately a force multiplier. That's what right. it is. Like understanding situations, understanding spacing distance, and it's a force multiplier if you know how to do it. But there is at a point where physics still runs true. So like if my right. false <laughs> multiplier max to the peak does not succeed your force, then I'm still going to lose. Like, right. Uh, I think there's this, <laughs> there's this fun video with um, World's Strongest Man, uh, one of them, Brian Shaw, I don't know if you, mm. uh, or like Thor from Game of Thrones, if you know okay. him. Okay, yeah, right? yeah. So those dudes are all like 450 pounds. They're the right. size of like multiple humans. Mm. Um and they had one of them just like play grapple with a existing UFC fighter, like Dustin Poirier. He's like a, you know, he's he he's like a contender for champ. Like so, he's not like, right. He's not so small guy either. He fights like one fifty five, but he probably walks around like two hundred pounds. Right. And just the weight of the strong man on him, he was like, all right, I can't breathe. I'm tired. Because it's like two people, right? They don't know yeah. what they're doing. They're just kind of holding and squishing him. So I feel like that's one of those instances where it's like mm-hmm. you understand. There's still limitations to what you can do. Right. Uh, but, totally. Yeah. That's, I, I still would like, I'll probably watch that after this. <laughs> <laughs> so you get your, uh, you get your butt kicked at this competition and by ground grappling. And then do you immediately just go, Oh, I need to get out of this Sancho Wushu and like try this sport out. Or was there kind of like a period in between? Uh, yeah, I didn't, I went home and I YouTube how to escape mount. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know I was still doing Sancho. I wasn't like, Oh, this is useless. I was just like, there, Oh, this whole thing I've been neglecting. That was just like the two dudes humping each other on the ground thing. There's something there. I got to learn more. Okay. about that. <laughs> uh, So I think when I came back from the summer, uh, I, I joined my school's club uh, at the time mm-hmm. and, um, I didn't know at the time, but like, um, uh, the the jujitsu that I was getting from uh, this is part of a uh, Colombia's like grappling thing. It's like we had these two guys who were John Donaher is uh, so for jujitsu the current like best coach in the world John Donaher is actually okay. he's a he's actually from New Zealand but he like lives in the U S now in Puerto Rico. But those two dudes were the students of his mm-hmm. and. My first jujitsu instruction was from like that lineage of people, and mm-hmm. it was like great instruction. Like I said, it was very technical in nature. Yeah, and I was like, wow, this is like, I, I like I like to nerd out on these things. So, but when I first learned jujitsu, I was just like, wow, there's like there's so much here to learn. And I thought that was just like how jujitsu is taught everywhere because yeah, like, there's like high level, very systematic breakdown of everything. It's mm-hmm. not like most, <laughs> if you. <laughs> If you go to like a regular jiu-jitsu gym and the guy is like from Brazil, he probably doesn't speak English even. So it's like, all humping. He's like, day one, get on the floor, we'll be humping each other. <laughs> That's as technical as it gets. <laughs> yeah. It, or, yeah. It's more like, okay, guys, stay this move. Ah, all right. And that's the amount of instruction you get versus like, mm-hmm. all right, I'm using my hand to frame against this. I'm, I don't want to, this barrier, this line over here, I don't want to create this. But what I'm trying to do is like, you get these little yeah. more holistic understandings of what you're trying to do or like, yeah. Uh, I, a, a basic example I would give is like a tabletop is something that you learn. So we're okay. we, humans were quad pods, right? We have four limbs. Right. So if you imagine a person kind of as a table, so all limbs extended on the ground, uh, how do you knock a table down? You take out one of its bases, right? Yeah. So, but if you take out a base, you actually want to, uh, so for example, if you're on all fours and I want to take out your right arm and I push that right arm out, so you have no base of support there. Uh, the best way to tip you over once I take that base of support over is actually flip you over that existing base, not to the left or not in the front, but 45 degrees. Mm-hmm. So I would actually elevate you from your rear in the opposite direction and mm-hmm. push down in the base that I pushed up. So that's a right. basic mechanic for any time I want to take a person over. Like mm-hmm. if I want to throw them over on top of me, I'm using that mechanic. So if you understand that, regardless of what move specifically I'm trying to teach you, you understand yeah. the concept of the mechanics behind what I'm trying to achieve. 
Wow. That's that's like a really good way to explain that. <laughs> I think that like that's that's so cool. I did, I honestly like I all I knew about going into this interview, all I knew know about Bra- Brazilian jiu-jitsu is that it's some type of ground grappling. I didn't yeah. realize it was so like it was so heady. <laughs> I didn't realize there's so much strategy to it. So how long um, how long were you doing jujitsu in school under this instructor, the more technical one you're talking about? Uh, I was there for, I think I, I graduated like a year afterward, uh, not less than a year. So I did less than less than a year there. And then I, I moved to Boston afterwards. So okay. I started working and then I've been doing jujitsu in Boston for like the past seven years. Seven years. Wow. <laughs> do you uh do, do you have like one do you call it a, like what do they what do they call a, a, a jujitsu place? Do they call it like a dojo or anything? Just or a gym. I mean, you just a, a gym. Dojo. Most people just call it a jujitsu gym. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Have you been going to the same gym all the whole time you've been yeah. in Boston? Wow. Same gym. It's uh, been rebranded a bunch of times, but uh it's the same gym. It's called six one seven five sports, if anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, you can uh, check out Peter. Go meet him at the gym and uh, challenge him to a ground humping contest. <laughs> yes, yes you can. I'll, I'll probably just have someone else do it for me because I don't like the. Actually, the highest chance that you get injured is by rolling with a new person. Really? They don't. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. So, like the more experienced people prefer not to roll with. Roll is the term for sparring. Yeah. It's okay. On the ground, so it's rolling. Okay, it's uh, not humping. It's rolling. Okay. It's rolling. <laughs> uh, uh, it's um yeah the injury risk is high because you don't know what you're doing so like mm-hmm. and we know as we've been doing jujitsu for long enough that we know you're going to lose a hundred percent the question is are you going to elbow me in the face in the process right right because <laughs> your body's still spazzy and uncontrolled and like i don't know people are just like they know the outcome so they'd rather not like risk the unnecessary bodily harm just to prove a point that they already know so what right. they'll do is they'll send like a younger belt like a blue belt is after white they'll be like just go with that fucking blue belt you'll still get your ass kicked the same amount <laughs> but like if you elbow him i don't care you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a full proxy war it's just like yeah, yeah you go you take care of this it's yeah. like uh, it reminds me. That's like playing chess against someone who has no idea what they're doing. You can't formulate a strategy if the other person doesn't know doesn't, how to yeah, formulate. Exactly. Strategy. You're just like, yeah. why would you do that move? Why? Like, yeah. But <laughs> it would be like chess, except every time they made a poor mistake, they just like kicked you in the face. As well, yeah. You know I mean, it's like we're, we're not <laughs> worst game of chess ever. <laughs> so, uh, do you? Uh, I'm guessing you compete in jujitsu, right? Yeah, uh, I haven't recently because of the whole pandemic and uh, I got a couple injuries. But yeah, I used mm-hmm. to compete pretty consistently. What was your first competition like in jujitsu? Oh, man. And, ha- uh, and how far in were you at the time? I was, uh, I think I was less than six months, maybe three, somewhere mm-hmm. around there. I, uh, so there's, a, there's different tiers of competition, as you can guess, right? There's your small okay. local, there's more bigger local as you and then like professional level right there's a whole spectrum mm-hmm. and on the lowest of that spectrum is uh, called naga so it's a north american grappling association they're still around and uh yeah they so what they do is obviously in competition you have weight classes and then you also have divisions for your relative experience level right okay so you have like um uh you have like a white belt blue belt purple belt brown belt black belt that's the belt scheme for jiu-jitsu and mm-hmm. then there's gi and no gi. Gi meaning you're wearing that gi top with the belt. No gi, you're wearing kind of like spats or like scuba diving gear. If you want to think yeah. about that. Way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a whole other thing. But which which just, one is which one is higher in skill level, or is it just different? It's different. Uh, okay. People want to argue about it, but uh, it's yeah. This it, this advantage is pros and cons of both. Uh, as you get older, people prefer the jacket because you can make actual grips. Okay. Because it's meant to mimic clothing. The idea is if you're fighting someone, they're probably wearing clothes. They're not wearing spats. Right. They're not naked. Oh, it's, true. So it's it's a valid point, right? Gotcha. Okay. But um, So I was in that competition. I was in a novice division, uh, or as my coach at the time liked to call it, the crazies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, he's not wrong. Like, if you have less than three to six balls of jiu-jitsu, you don't know what you're doing, right? You're just going like the exact scenario you're just going in you're charging and you're like ah but like you don't know what you're doing so uh <laughs> i love that the crazies i'm gonna start calling like really new comedians that. the crazies yeah, yeah. The crazies. <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, because he knows it's just like two people who don't know what they're doing trying to kill each other. Like, cause yeah. there's no control. You don't know any actual jujitsu. You don't know any moves really. Like, that's the cool thing about competition. Like, uh, you find out what you really know. Because like right. in the heat of the moment, the only thing you, there's no time to really think, especially at that level. So it's just like whatever your body knows, which is like almost nothing. Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I did okay. I got like a bronze at my first uh tournament i think i i got foot locked once and i won like two other matches nice one of them i, I had a guy in a guillotine which is when you kind of like choke them from the front uh, okay uh, stranglehold but uh i i learned that day that you shouldn't hold on to a stranglehold if you don't have it which i didn't know previous like i held it for like a minute and a half and if you hold something for that long and it's if you hold something past like 10 seconds and it's not working you should give up and do something else right like uh, a full I, minute and a half that's like he should be dead yeah he <laughs> if should be dead if, if this was working which is a clear indication that it's not right but, <laughs> you know, i didn't know that at the time so i just held on and then after the match i remember i was like coach i cannot feel my arms there is literally so much blood in my arms that they do not move anymore they are 100 <laughs> percent gassed out uh, but yeah, no, it was fun. Wow. So, so how do you, uh, going off that first competition, um, how, how do you compete? Like, okay, let's say pre Corona pre injuries, how, how, like what, what, uh, division or like rank were you competing in? Uh, so I'm a purple belt now. Uh, okay. So I was good people at, at every belt level. I just competed at the belt level that I was. Okay. Uh, so purple, it's like the middle one, right? After that is brown and black. So okay. They usually say similar to I actually I like to draw analogies between comedy and jujitsu, and I think yeah. like uh, people say it takes about a decade for you to get your black belt in jujitsu, mm-hmm. roughly. Uh, assuming you're training like three four times a week, uh, like relatively consistently, uh, at least. Yeah. And, and in comedy, it takes you about a decade for you to be you know uh, at any level that's like good. Right. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like. I think uh, I came I came into comedy with the expectation expectation that it would be a long game. Like, yeah, yeah. OK, I'm going to give like it's going to be like seven to ten years before anything really comes of this. So I'm not going to beat myself up on the way there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's like a it's, a it's like a journey. Right. And I feel mm-hmm. like it, you know how comedians aren't the nicest people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so like when you first start comedy, like it's kind of like. Uh, at, at least in Boston, like it's kind of it's a little clicky, and then people don't like really talk to you until they've seen you stick around for a little bit. Yeah, which yeah. I don't really like. I feel like it should be friendlier, but there's also an aspect of it that I understand because in jujitsu, it's a similar thing where it's like, uh, getting beat up every day is not fun. So like, it yeah. takes a particular type of person to want to come back from that. So yeah. people don't usually learn white belts' names until they're like blue belts, which is like two years in. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I don't need to know your name. I don't know if you're going to be back. Uh, I think that's like so the exact same thing. It's like more experienced people. You don't want to invest in like newbies and like give them your time and attention unless you're sure like, oh, this person is going to be around for a while, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's interesting. It's the same, I think, think with comedy, except uh, I think the other thing is like, it's just you get tapped and it's painful and it's like it like hurts you right yeah you know, both physically and and and, and mentally and, and emotionally <laughs> uh, and in comedy it's like the silence does the same thing uh arguably worse <laughs> you're just like wow like why do i do this why am i up here trying to do this <laughs> so so you would rather you would rather get injured and lose a fight than bomb on stage at a show i Get injured is different because now you're like physically. Right. I think when you when because in jujitsu you can train safely. You tap like you right. get me in a submission hold. I'll tap, but like it still feels bad. Like no one enjoys tapping. Yeah. And when you're starting, you you sh- you should tap as much as you can because there's no reason for you to get hurt. Right. There's nothing on the line. You don't know anything. I mean, not everyone takes that advice, but it's what you should be doing. Like <laughs> you should be tapping, tap quickly, tap a lot. Uh, it still doesn't feel good, but you you do it. But the silence on stage, that's there's nothing you, you can't tap out to the silence. You know what I mean? Like if I'm bombing and like I'm out of like you know, I gotta just keep going. I gotta mm. I gotta I gotta work through my pain. Uh yeah. so I would say it's almost worse the just the, the just that, that. 
Because you got to keep suffering. You got to keep. Gotta, yeah, there's you no, have there's people no watch. giving up unless you like just stop doing comedy, right? Like you got to run through that set still. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think there. There's sometimes I see like new comedians and they'll come to like a mic or whatever, and they'll do like two and a half minutes that are like really good, and then two and a half minutes that are painful and just silent. I'm like, you should have quit while you're ahead. You didn't have to use the whole time. It's just a mic. Just take take your take your W and get out of here. Like, <laughs> leave on a good impression. <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a good point too. Yeah. But the other thing is, it's a mic, right? So, like, we understand, yeah. like, mics aren't shows. Like, you know, right. no one's paying that much attention. Uh, depends on the mic, but, you know, there's good mics, there's okay mics, but even good mics are not, they're not shows, they're not real people. Yeah. Right? Like, and I, I think I remember when I went to Tiny Cupboard, uh, when I was in New York with you, mm-hmm. I remember, because in Boston, the list gets up to, like, the list sometimes get up to, like, 40, 50 people, but yeah. at any one time, the room probably doesn't have more than 25 people in it. So, mm-hmm. like, and I remember the tiny cover mics. You guys had like a hundred people on a rooftop. That was insane, right? <laughs> I, I, and I was like, and I was doing, I, I was watching the mic, and people were it's a mic, so people are bombing as they should be. Uh, you know, it's the mic. Uh, <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, I was like, huh, the sound of you know two people in an open mic not paying attention is the same as the sound of a hundred people at an open <laughs> mic not paying attention. This is exactly the same. Yeah, uh, it's like you wouldn't you wouldn't think that rooftop can get so quiet, but it can. Oh yeah, it can. I was like, "Where's that six train? God damn it!" <laughs> yeah, it's it, it. I don't know. It, it's uh There's nothing quite like it. I, I don't. Nothing in my life gave me the uh, self esteem, like introspection, like bombing at open mics. And uh, what I think is funny now is now that I'm like getting like better at comedy, I'm like wanting to do new jokes or like try riffing more. So I'll go to open mics full YOLO. And like the people who know me already know I have good material, but then there's new people who see me and they're probably, I'm like, they think I suck at this. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I'm just out here. I'm trying new things. And if I can get them to laugh one time, they'll be like, oh, okay, maybe he's all right. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's how you get better. I mean, it's uh, right? the like same thing. It's just mm-hmm. to tell you, like, if you get really good at a move, and I know I'm going to, like, like, if I'm going against someone who I know is not very good, there's no me- reason for me to use my A moves. Let me work on some BC stuff. Like, let me right. try to- refine those things so like there's no if I, i'm not gonna go to a mic with all polished material unless i'm like just move there and i need to show people that like yeah. hey i don't suck <laughs> like you know like book me on your shows but like yeah you're going to the work like you know, like crowd work too like i'm trying to get better at crowd work so oh, yeah the only way you get better crowd work is you suck at crowd work for a long time but you're trying crowd work until yep. you know it's <laughs> And it's hard because a lot of times the only time you get to do real crowd work is when you're on a show. Yes, that's that's the hard part too, exactly. You only get to practice when the stakes are real. Yes, okay. Crowd work at an open mic was like when you know everybody and it's like, stop asking me questions, man. Do your fucking jokes, get off. Exactly. So within uh, like jujitsu, what were your like early challenges? Like were you... Like in terms of like, just is what was your main like uh, challenge like going into this new type of martial art? Was it like coordination, or was it balance, or was it being oriented on the ground? Did you have some specific area that you really needed to work on that you identified? Yes, I needed to work on my ego. That's that's what I did. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I I started doing jujitsu. I think in the peak of when I was powerlifting. Still, so okay. Uh, I was like, I was. Re- probably like the strongest i was in my life at that point mm-hmm. and i think i went into jujitsu and i was like whatever i'm still stronger than all these people right and, and then i i went in on my first day of actual rolling and there was this like 145 pound uh purple belt, purple belt. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's like if you're a purple belt you're, pretty, you're in the middle like i said yeah like, you've been doing this a solid amount of time and uh i was just like ha, i'm gonna crush this guy like he's puny yeah uh, and then he tapped me like seven times, like back to back to back, back to back. <laughs> and I remember at one point he put me in a, it's called a crucifix. It's like a, he, he wraps his legs around one arm and then they mm-hmm. wrap their upper body around the other arm. So okay. So just kind of like a floating head on the ground, okay. if you imagine. It's kind of uh, like a full Nelson, but you're using your whole body instead of your arm. You're using your whole body, right? Yeah. Now, I still didn't know jujitsu, but I was like, all right, he has both my upper limbs 
I don't know what to do with my legs. I'm kind of just a floating head here. I think he's winning. Uh, I think he's <laughs> winning. Uh, but, yeah, so I think if I were to go back and start jiu-jitsu again, I would try to take the advice of, like, tap early, tap quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a lot of times where I was just like, I wouldn't tap. Like, my arm is already fully extended, but I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm a power lifter. I'm going to try to curl your whole body. And it doesn't work. Like, you can't. Like, one leg yeah. does not beat four limbs and a fucking hip you know what i mean like your, yeah. your one limb is not stronger than any entire body or two limbs usually you know what i mean like it just mm-hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way um <laughs> so i think i was a little stubborn on that front and i i, I like had a lot of unnecessary mm-hmm. injuries that put me out like it's like dude just tap and then just go again that's the beauty of jiu-jitsu <laughs> you can keep training without getting hurt yeah so when what what was the did you have like a turning point where you were like all right I can I can lose and feel fine about this did you have like a moment where you finally accepted it? <laughs> well, let's to put it clearly, no one enjoys tapping. Stuff, right. Yeah. But it's like I think the difference is back then how tapping felt like I was like holy shit like this I can never tap no this is yeah. losing versus now it's like all right he got me like, uh, yeah I don't like this but uh, he got me like it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's, that's the difference. And I think it's a, it's a progression. I'm sure if you ask me like five years from now, I'm going to be more okay with tapping than I am today. You know I mean? it's just right. Like, understand that tapping is learning. I think that's the difference. It's like, all right, you fucked up. Go Definitely. Back. Don't let it happen again. Yeah. yeah. Also, s- same as comedy. It's like when you first start and you bomb, it's like, oh, it hurts so bad. But once you bomb like a hundred times, you're like, I do this shit all day. Uh, yeah. It's fine. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it still doesn't feel great. Yeah. Right? You, it's still like, all right. But you understand it's part of the process. It's like, how else am I supposed to test these fucking jokes? Right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I've told this in the pod, this podcast before, but like I used, you know, you bomb open mics for a long time and you're like, okay, it's yeah, it sucks, but you kind of get over it. And then when I got to New York City, I bombed the first show I got booked on so hard that I went and I drank alone for the first and only time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this this was really rough. And now it's like, okay, if I don't have a good show, I'm like, all right, I'll do better next time. It's not the end of the world, but still, yeah. it all it always sucks. Losing always sucks. <laughs> Losing always sucks. You just you get you like you get more okay with it. You understand. It's a long journey, and you're gonna you're gonna lose along the way. Exactly. <laughs> so, do you do you uh, do any jujitsu instruction, or have you done any of that in your seven yeah, year career? I used, to, I used to teach this uh, leg lock class for for like a year and year and a half before the pandemic. But uh, then we had a couple owner switches, so now they they run the class. To be fair, mm-hmm. they're like world champs, so they can do whatever they want. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I taught some classes for a while and then intermittently before that. Uh, teaching's fun. I enjoy teaching. Teaching, mm-hmm. I think, exposes you to what you do and do not know and how much, how well you actually know it. Definitely. Uh, I think with, uh, with a lot of uh, physical activity, uh, a lot of Olympians are, like, great athletes or horrendous teachers. Like, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Their bodies just, like, understand mechanics so well, but their brain is unable to they never had to internalize information for themselves. So right. that's why they say, if you want to learn jujitsu, learn it from a small person, learn it from right. the smallest person you can find because they could never cheat anything. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, they, they had to figure out every single little tiny little detail to get them that little bit more mechanical advantage for them to win. Definitely. And I think that's the cool thing about teaching. It shows you what you really do or you don't know because mm-hmm. A lot of athletes, like, their bodies know what they're doing, but they don't know what they're doing. They just, like... Right. It's just second nature. It's second nature. Yeah, they just... Body, their bodies learn very quickly, but their brain never, uh, you know, picked up the, the difference. So, like, if you want to right. teach, you have to... Teaching is not about what I know. It's about what I can teach you, right? It's right. What information I can relay to you that you can then use that to be successful. Like that's Definitely. what a good teacher does. And right. most college professors suck at this. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're, just, they're just like experts in their field. Some of them aren't even experts in their field, but they definitely suck at teaching. Um, I had a, I went to engineering school and like we, I always had this problem with professors. There was like academic professors who were very good at teaching material and then you would have professors that came from the field where they were like, oh, they have like a 50-year career in this type of engineering. 
Now they're a professor for you guys. And those guys were the worst because when you're trying to learn the basics, they're telling you all the basics don't matter. And it's it's true. Now that I'm like a working engineer, I'm like, oh yeah, all those basics, like it's good to know how to solve those problems and know what to what questions to ask when you need, but none of it matters. But when you're in school, you're like, I literally cannot wrap my mind around what you're telling me. I just I we <laughs> what how do I take this exam, you know? Yeah, yeah. I totally get that. What so kind when of you, are you I'm a, a by my degree is electrical engineering with a focus in radio frequency. Okay, so you- what do, you, what do you work as like a audio engineer or no i'm uh right now i'm a syst- i'm a radio systems engineer okay. so like public safety radio like fire ems all that stuff gotcha. okay cool what about you are you are you similar uh no my uh, my roommate was like a he was a mechanical engineer that then went on to do like acoustics engineering oh, okay PhD thing. he brought a theremin into our, our room and practiced Ooh. It for a long time <laughs> that's uh, cool you, 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 no it's not cool see, <laughs> see, because see you have to as the roommate you have to deal with the jackass trying to learn how to play a theremin which i don't know <laughs> if people know the sound of a theremin it doesn't sound good even when it's played well okay <laughs> yeah exactly just imagine that for hours i am like uh, uh, <laughs> Because you, you, I ask, because usually, like, I'll say I'm an engineer, and then other engineers are al- almost the only ones that say what type and, like, break uh, it down. <laughs> yeah, I did a, I was a chemical engineer for, like, undergrad. That's oh, okay. what I do now, yeah. Okay, but well, your degree is in chemical engineering? Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, respect, because, like, in, in, our, in the electrical engineering mind, the only other engineering that we were, like, they're on our level is, like, chemical <laughs> engineers. Yes. <laughs> same, same thing in my school yes it's like the EEs they, they do work we we also have a bunch of shit the civvies have it the easiest yeah uh and and then the mechies yeah, sure. yeah me- like mechanical is like the default option and then i feel like <laughs> we always joke that if you couldn't hack it in electrical engineering you just went straight to computer science like <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, I feel like the com- looking back, I would say the comp side people is probably better for your money to, to dollar ratio. It's probably better to like, I don't know. There's a lot of engineering that you learn you don't know, actually use. So I don't know. It's oh, like, so much. Right. It's like, why not just learn fucking logic coding and then like make a bunch of money? It makes more sense. It, it totally does. I, I think in, in hindsight, like I got into engineering because I wanted to be able to manipulate Do things stuff, in physical right? reality, you know, yeah. and like. Oh, but coding doesn't really do anything just me on a on a computer. And in hindsight, it's like, oh, it would have been a, a wiser career move to just go into like CS because then it'd be like such a broad like there's so many more jobs you can do. Yep. yep. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so in your uh in your jujitsu journey, when did you start doing comedy? Like when when uh-huh. did that that kind of fall in line? Um was I a purple belt already? I was either late stage blue belt or almost a purple belt. How long have you been doing comedy for? Like two years. Two years. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So how <laughs> how did how does this like work out? Like how did how did you find comedy? Like it's interesting that like you started like the martial arts first and then got into stand up. Mm, yeah, uh, I think I've always enjoyed comedy. Like I watched a lot of stand up. Mm. Watch a lot of Chappelle back in the day. I never really thought about doing it, to be honest. I never yeah. really thought about doing it until I, I started doing it. I think I was uh I was reading this book at the time. It's called the, it's a Japanese book. It's called Ikigai. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's like a explained simply. It's like a four way Venn diagram of uh what what you're good at, what you're passionate about, what you can get paid for, and what the world needs. Uh, it's like one of those things. Well, like you could find something that intersects the four-way Venn diagram, boom, you found your purpose. You're great. Yeah. You're living blissfully. And I think at the time I was like examining my job, which I hated. I was working like a lot of, a lot of overtime for no additional monetary gain. And, uh, it was like, a my, my teammates were starting to leave cause it was like a, not a good, uh, company culture. And mm-hmm. then I also, I went through a breakup and then I was going to put all my f- time to jujitsu but then my, uh, then then my leg broke. So uh, I was like, "All right, I need to find something else to do." Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and then I think the culmination of all those things is like, you know what, let me give stand-up a try. Maybe this will be my key guy. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, de- I mean, looking back at it now, I'm certainly not good enough at it, nor can I make money off of it. So it doesn't feel <laughs> like two of the major boxes, uh, but it feels not the yet. other two. Not yeah. yet. So. It's funny uh, how many comedians I've talked to that their starting comedy aligns with like a breakup like just like yeah. a couple weeks before it's so yes. many people i think yes. it's like you, you have everyone has this moment where they're like oh the thing that'll make me happy is another person then the breakup happens and you're like okay well i need to make me happy without <laughs> another person <laughs> yeah a lot of like divorcees and stuff like that it's pretty, mm-hmm. it's pretty common <laughs> so uh, when you when you started stand-up did you have things uh, that you learned from jujitsu that like helped you with your like com- coming into the community and like learning a new skill? Like, did you have like come in with like good perspective on like practice? Yes, but also you just remind me of another reason why I did comedy is because after the breakup, I broke my leg and I started playing Magic the Gathering. And, <laughs> okay, uh, I Hell thought yeah. that was really funny because people were like, "So wait, you." You were single, and you decided to start playing Magic the Gathering instead. And I was like, yes, this is what I'm choosing to do with my time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, I thought that was pretty funny. So, uh, But yeah, no, I think <laughs> doing jujitsu, I I realized that it's going to be work to get good. And the thing, it's, it's like hours. It's hours in. Like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I feel like after school, like you, the th- cool thing about being like past school is that you can take the skills that you use to like learn things that you don't like learning and yeah. apply them to learning things that you actually do want to learn. Right? <laughs> Definitely. And it's so much better. Cause like you have all the tools to do it. And I really think that uh, obviously there's innate ability for anything, any activity skill or that needs to be learned. But if you put in the hours, like you can't get away with not putting in the hours. So mm-hmm. Jiu Jitsu, that's mat time. You want to get better. You have to spend time on the mats. You have to analyze what you're doing off the mats, but like, Comedy to me is uh, stage time, right? So yeah, if you want to get better at being on stage, you got to get on stage. You can get better at writing off stage, but if you want to be better comedian, like a comedian to me is not a a, a joke writer by itself. Like a right. comedian is a joke writer who can also control a room of people who has that like confidence right. on stage to be able to like to control mm-hmm. crowd to work that energy back. It's not just like a joke writer. Joke right. writer to me is actually. Uh, it's only one component, at least mm-hmm. the way I see it. Absolutely, uh, right. So uh, I was like, all right, this is like you've got to get better at this. You have to, you have to, you have to write. You have to get on stage as much as you can, and that's how you get better. So I, mm-hmm. I look at them as sets and reps, like like yeah. I'm doing jujitsu or I'm lifting weights. Like it's like I don't care if I bomb because I'm still getting a set in. I'm still getting a rep in. You know what I mean? Like, totally. I'm, let's say if all my materials, or let's say I'm on a mic where I know no one's pay attention and I don't want to bother trying material, maybe I'll just riff for five minutes. Now I've got yeah. five, five minutes on riffing. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I and I would, I would say to everyone out there interested in stand up, it's also way cheaper than Magic the Gathering. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yeah, it pro- probably is. Um, and it probably has equal amount chance of getting you laid. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the uh, the scene is like in jujitsu, but I'd say maybe similar. <laughs> uh, jujitsu is pretty male dominated. Yeah, but I I will say that I f- uh, I think women probably prefer that you do jujitsu over Magic the Gathering. <laughs> pretty definitively can say that statement. You're They're- like you're like I can defend your honor in two ways though. I can do it on the mat or with my deck. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I, I saw you over a pandemic. You were like doing this thing. Uh, what were you like? I think you were painting. Um, what are those called? War, not war tribes. Um, oh, oh, you okay? So okay, so I got coronavirus, and I started building gunpla, which is like the it's like the Japanese model kits that they make gun like they're Gundams. Like yes, yeah, the, they're, they're Gundams. And you wrote something that's like rebuilding my virginity or something. I was yeah, like, <laughs> that reminded me of my. I was like. I'm playing magic. We're doing the same thing. Uh, 
I think I think it's just one of the, like those those types of things are like those like guilty like adult like super nerd things. It's like okay, yes. I yes. I have my life together in so many ways. This one is for me. Okay, yes. I want to yes. build robots. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's I I can totally get it. Like my friend Kirby makes fun of me. He's like, "You're a grown man. Why are you playing Magic the Gathering?" He's like, "Fuck you. I'm a grown man. I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm <laughs> choosing to play Magic the Gathering." Oh yeah, I it's. <laughs> Like, part of me, like, I, I, I played Magic for a long time in high school, but I was never, like, I didn't, I didn't put enough money in to be, like, good, good. And, like, every now and then there's, like, a little voice that's, like, play Magic. Play Magic again. And I'm, like, I can't. I can't do it. I got <laughs> I gotta work on no, jokes. Right. Like, <laughs> there's, there's other things. You, got, you gotta bite your time. You can't, you can't get fully sucked in either. That's, that's definitely not good. But exactly. <laughs> it could be, like, a little guilty pleasure thing. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious. So when you when you kind of get into stand up more, like I I feel like about a year year and a half into stand up for me, I started to get like more actualized. Two years in, it felt like pretty good. And did you have lessons you learned in stand up that you could then apply back into your jujitsu? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've. I think I've only thought of it the other way around. Yeah. But uh, I don't. Uh... Yeah, I've only ever thought of it as like, all right, jujitsu, because I, I was like, I want to take the discipline mm-hmm. from the jujitsu training and apply that to stand up. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, is there anything I've learned from stand up that I could apply back to jujitsu? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I. Yeah, you don't I have to have an answer. I've learned stuff in stand up that I've applied to stand up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess the one thing I learned about stand up is that you have to. What I. I, I, I saw stand up as a long journey thing, but I, I didn't mm-hmm. I think I was so trying to get I was like I'm so behind and I'm trying to get as good as I can as quickly as possible that I was trying to do like two, three sets a night yeah every night and mm-hmm. eventually you like burn out doing that because like well first of all you got your regular day job, you got your friends, your family, whatever other hobbies you gotta try to fit in that. If you're trying to date or whatever, you, you got that as well. So like I think I realized if I put this in the jujitsu perspective where I'm still like, cause I did that with jujitsu too. And I got right. injured as well. I was like, you have to like tone it down enough that you still have to live your life. Like if you want to view this thing as a decade thing, you still have to uh, kind of like plot your time uh, well enough that you have time to do all the things that you want to do. Exactly. Yeah. I, mean? I, I think so many of like our friends that I or I know, like they, we've talked about this exact thing. Is you start and you're like, I am gonna go up as much as possible. Like Lee, who you met, uh, she yep. would go up when she first started. I moved to New York City. I was doing like five to eight mics, maybe like five to ten mics a week, and that's like a cruise control. I'm like, nice. That's like quite a few. Lee was doing like twenty eight to like thirty. And I told her, I was like, you got to stop this at some point, like, because it doesn't do anything. And now it's like, I do, I mean, this is kind of low right now, but like, I do like, you know, four to five sets a week. And I'm like, I'm happy with it. I'm like, nice. And this gives me room to breathe and work on my other projects. And yep, yep. at a certain point too, you realize it's like, oh, I don't have to go to every shitty mic. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's no such a relief. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, you mean I don't like... Back when I first started, it was like, okay, go to every every spot you can. And like, oh, I'll go to some awful mic where I'm like, I have to go at the end of a 30-person list. And I do just like a, a two minutes. No one laughs. And now it's like, <laughs> no, I don't have time for that. Okay? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's like, it, like, like you said, you like, you're in it long enough that you know what's worthwhile and what's right. sustainable. And like, mm-hmm. there's a pace that you can keep for a certain while that's not sustainable. And you realize like, the gain or like the risk to reward ratio is just not worth it. Like this is Mike is going to go past one o'clock. I'm fucking 47 on the list. When I go up, there'll be like four other people who are like dead asleep. Like yep. I'm going to go home at night. That's, that's yeah. what I'm going to do. <laughs> you know I mean? Totally. So how do you, so I know we're, we're obviously in a pandemic. So there's like kind of special circumstances going on, but like how, how do you, how do you typically balance jujitsu and comedy? Cause you're pretty serious about both. Uh, so what I used to do back when it was like, uh, before pandemic is I would mm-hmm. do jujitsu and then I'd shower really quickly. And then I'd, uh, I'd built off enough social credit in my gym that people know me that I can like get away a little bit more stuff. Like mm-hmm. I can leave a little bit early. Like usually you stick around, you hang out, you know, so it's like, a yeah. Thing. Uh, 
that I, I would just like pop out and then I would try to do like, you know, two or three mics or like, mm-hmm. a show in there. Uh, and I was actually burning out doing that because I was doing that oh, yeah. f- for a pretty long time. <laughs> um, and then pandemic hit and that was actually a good break because I mm-hmm. stopped doing both for a while, jujitsu, because obviously it's, it's like probably the highest COVID thing that you Highest chance of getting COVID thing you could do, right? It's, yeah, that's like a guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, it's like a guarantee. Like, it's like a, unless you're having like mass orgies, that's like the only thing that I can think that would beat jujitsu <laughs> in terms of like transmission rate. Um, but then Zoom comedy became a thing, right? It's kind of, kind of hopped yeah. on that train. Outdoor comedy when it was nice. So I did some of that. So mm-hmm. the pacing kind of actually slowed down. So nowadays, uh, it, with the Zoom comedy, it's actually easy because we're still like, if I do jujitsu, I can come back and I do a couple Zoom shows. Uh, yeah. No problem. You don't even have to shower. I don't have to, sh- yeah. <laughs> I don't even have to shower. I don't have to, like, the driving in between places. Mm-hmm. I do miss, like, having that clockwork. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. When you're, like, in between mics, you're like, oh, I got this thing. And then they yeah. on the door. And now I just you could try it immediately. But now mm-hmm. it's kind of, you do it on a Zoom platform instead. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's good. I think, yeah, for, for lots of people, like, mostly comedians that i know pandemic was like such a breath of fresh air for like the first like month and a half because it was like oh we're all spinning our wheels and like burning out and then oh everyone has to stop at the same time oh so i don't have to feel bad about (laughs) relax nice (laughs) so what's the uh what's your jujitsu jujitsu situation now are like is stuff kind of opening up or is that kind of off the table for the time being no, they're they're opening up. There's a depending on what gym you're at, what school, they're either running like small cohort group classes, or mm-hmm. they're just uh, they're doing like some form of temperature check, or they're just back to full training. So it's really it depends on what your what city you're in, what the mandates are, what your gym is comfortable. Doing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, how big is like the 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 jujitsu scene in Boston? Uh, there's only like. Th- it's like if 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 you do jujitsu and you compete, I probably know you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's as big as the comedy scene, maybe plus a few more. It's a, probably a little bit bigger than the comedy scene. Like mm-hmm. I think I, I think for the most part, know all of the regular comics. Um, yeah. There are potentially there's definitely more jujitsu gyms than comedy, actually, without a doubt. I would say probably like four mm-hmm. or five fold more people. Um, there's like regular people do jiu-jitsu that I just wouldn't know. Yeah. If you've never competed or anything like that, you just like mm-hmm. train at your regular gym. But like, there's only so many mics in Boston that like, if you're, if you're a comedian in Boston, I should know who you are. Right. Right. Yeah. Just curious. Do you guys, does your gym have like beef with another gym? Uh, <laughs> I, our gym doesn't have a beef specifically with other gyms, but we've had like, we used to be aligned with this other gym called red line they went away for a while Mm -hmm. they're like coming back and then like there were some gym splits every now here and there but no i think the the gym like versus gym rivalry thing is like less common only the movies (laughs) yeah that's like a old thing i I, the top level competition gyms have beef like Mm -hmm. like, top level they like oh because they like trying to see who's better like as a team as a unit but those like schools are in like california Mm-hmm. Like Florida and New York, there. Boston is not as a uh, competitive of a hub for that. Right, right. What are like, uh, like internationally? What are like the the top countries in jujitsu? Oh, it's obviously it's Brazil because they, okay. they, you know, it's Brazilian <laughs> jujitsu. Uh, yeah, and I think the the Americans are starting to make a pretty good headway in the no gi scene. So the gi scene, mm-hmm. like I said, with with the with the pajama pants, uh, the Brazilians are still like the top uh yeah nogi uh that guy john donahue i told you about he's kind of mm-hmm. like led this new movement of systematizing specifically nogi jiu-jitsu in a mm-hmm. way that his students have been able to beat a lot of the brazilian elites and they've kind of taken their spot oh wow uh, so and then past that i don't know every other country doesn't really matter right um <laughs> <laughs> it's like brazil the u.s japan uh Brazil, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is still a new sport, like relatively right. still evolving. Uh, so there's still like I don't know, it's not big enough to be that big internationally. All the this like different countries have their own versions of uh, of grappling, like you know Russia, mm-hmm. Russia has sambo. It's like Mongolian wrestling. Japan obviously has judo. 
like every country there's like Greco Roman wrestling, but they're all like different flavors of grappling. Uh, Brazilians came up Brazilian Jiu said they're gonna be the best at their flavor, right? At least until I feel like you gotta give it some time, and then as if it picks up, then you'll get to see where, where it goes. Mm-hmm. So, how long has it been around for as a sport? Is it is it like thirty years old or forty or as a sport? Yes. Yeah, Pretty young. I mean, UFCs, that was like 90s. So, you'd like, it's only really gotten big as a sport in the past like 10, 15 years, I would say. Oh, wow. So, it's pretty interesting. Big. It's been around as a sport. It's just like not like federations didn't really exist. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like mostly tournaments and like weird back, yeah, all yeah. Different, like alleys and garages. It's only recently that they're like doing like stadiums or like high schools. Like <laughs> yeah. No more fight clubs. Yeah, no more. Well, they still probably exist. You just gotta know some people. <laughs> so, in your in your seven year journey, ha, what has there been any big changes to jujitsu as a whole that you've noticed? I mean, if it's oh, such a young sport, absolutely. Like I said, yeah? uh, in the gi, like the Brazilians were doing right. very well, and then in no gi, this one guy just kind of came and revolutionized. He created a bunch of systems uh, built around other subsystems that like interview. Mm-hmm with each other in such a way that like only his students kind of knew what they were doing and now he started selling those dvds because they're so far ahead that even though he's selling you know a large portion of that information he knows it'll take a while for those people to catch up because it's right. not only knowing and putting the repetitions and the work to, to for your body to be able to just do it on command like that whoa that takes interesting time. So he was like, new expansion pack, just dropped, check it out. <laughs> we got yeah. new moves. <laughs> yeah, we got these new moves. We're like we're like four years in with these. Like, we know them very well. You mm-hmm. guys figured out the mechanics still. Like, so, like, he, he, he's free to drop that because he knows that they're, they're so ahead. Uh, but even wow. in, the, in the gi, like, there's, there's been a lot of improvement. So, yeah, it's still evolving relatively rapidly. Interesting. Do you feel like there is, like, in your own, like, jujitsu practice like within yourself do you feel like it gives you some room for creativity when you do matches or you do your rolling uh or do you, I, I is it say, kind of like a is it kind of like a defined strategy defined reaction type of thing i think everyone's jujitsu is dependent on a couple of different things so it's like the big big part is your body type that's going to differentiate what's going to work for you mm-hmm. like uh, you have like long people, you have short, stocky people, you have round people, like everyone has a different body type, right? Your personality, your disposition, that's all gonna uh, change how that's, I think that's the artistic part of the martial art is that you yeah. get to choose uh, what you enjoy doing. And that's gonna be influenced by your physical characteristics, but mm-hmm. also, you know, your natural personal tendencies. Like, there are moves mm-hmm. that require me to grind my head, my face, and people's crotches. I prefer not to do those. So I don't. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a creative liberty is not putting your face in a crotch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you know, cauliflower ear is a big thing that jujitsu people get, and I yeah. obviously have a little bit myself. But there's certain moves that I do that are less likely for me to do that. Mm-hmm. Also, I'm just like I'm not physically strong in certain positions, or my limbs aren't long enough. I'm not. I tried to do those back early. I was like, this is cool, but I, I can't do it. Like physically, yeah. it doesn't work. Or uh, you know, there there are moves that are better for long limb people that are. Or it's for short limb people, you know, like some back and forths. Mm-hmm. There's pros and cons to both situations. I think overall it's still better to be longer because there's more, you have more moves available to you, but there are mm-hmm. aspects of where if you're like shorter and stubbier, it's like help you, helps right. you as well. Uh, but yeah, your body type and your personality mm-hmm. ultimately is going to determine what jujitsu you enjoy doing. Yeah. It's like grindy jujitsu is fast, explosive, this mobility. It's like there's, there's so much going around that you, uh, I think it's gonna be hard for you to be create to create your new moves unless you're one of these top level competitors who mm-hmm. are gonna spend like eight hours on a mat every day. They're yeah. gonna be able to. They still create stuff, but like if you're just an everyday person, you're probably not gonna discover something they haven't already discovered. Right. But what you can do is you can play within this whole map of jujitsu. You find out what works for you. Hmm. Interesting. Where so would you? How would you describe yourself as a fighter slash roller? Because you seem like you seem like a very laid back kind of guy. Uh, I think I try to be more technical. Like I try. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't usually. Uh, I don't usually get very aggressive unless the mm-hmm. other person is becoming aggressive. Like I prefer to save. So I can't be very explosive. If I need to be, but I've also done this long enough that I know if I 
if I go explosive for long enough, I'm going to burn my tank pretty quick. Yeah. So, like, if I'm doing a regular training day, I'm rolling with, like, eight people, probably. There's, like, six-minute rounds. So, mm-hmm. if I burn my gas out on the first round, and I'm just going, you know, fucking balls to the wall on my first roll, uh, I'm not going to have anything. I'm going to be dead for, for right. all seven. So, I try not to do that. I try to, mm-hmm. I try to train, like, um, they say, like, uh, I, I think the Russians perfected this very well um, in Olympic lifting. They train every day, but they train at an intensity where they never really soar. So they're like hmm. 70, 70%, 75%. So the idea is that if I'm Olympic lifting, it's a very technical movement. I want to be able to do as many repetitions of that with as good of a form that's controllable that I can for as long as I can. You can go, let's say you go balls to the walls one day and you go 95%. And you get less reps onto it. Next day, now you're forced to rest because your muscles are sore. You can't do the same movement again. So now you're taking a day off, and then next day you can come back, and then the following day you have to take a day off. Compare mm-hmm. that to a guy who's working 75% for five days of that week. They not only got more, they were they were not only training every single day, but every single day they were able to create more repetitions of the same movement because they were working in a lower capacity. So their body is able to handle and recover sufficiently for the next day of training. That's so smart. And that is the best excuse for bombing at open mics. Like this is this isn't even my full power level. I'm just doing this so I can do this a bunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um That's that's so like I, I really like that though. It's like that's that's a good way to like think about it. Instead of just going so hard, it's like it's, even in training, it's just like instead of pushing yourself to the limit when you're training for something, why not just like do it and focus on the form and yeah, do it thoughtfully? No- there's no reason to hurt yourself and train. Like mm-hmm. the only time to up your intensity is when you're getting ready for competition, where you need to prepare your body to be moving at, at a higher pace. Mm-hmm. That that's the only time. But like if I'm just training to get better, which is what I'm doing now, I try not to go balls to the wall. Like it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't help me. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes like it feels good to do it because you're just like haha. But like I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I train at a. I try to train at that with with that mindset. Uh, mm-hmm. So when uh, when you're getting ready for like a competition, I'm just curious, like on like competition day, is it like wrestling where you just don't eat anything beforehand? Or is it like, do you do you like only eat like a little bit? Like what? what how does like food factor into this? Because it's a very like, I feel like this is a sport where you you could run out of energy quickly or you could just throw up everywhere. <laughs> um, so it depends. I usually I. I used to train on an empty stomach most of the time, and that works fine if I'm training in the mornings, but if you're mm-hmm. training at the end of the day, your body's pretty depleted, so yeah. you, it's not good for you. So if I'm competing in the morning, I usually, I still don't, don't eat anything. Mm-hmm. If I'm competing in the afternoon, I'll, I'll have to eat something. I need to get some carbs in there, get some, mm-hmm. get some energy reserves in my bloodstream. Uh, okay. But if you're cutting weight, now that's a whole other thing where it's like right. you probably have been starving yourself for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So that also factors in. But yeah, nutrition is a whole other aspect that I think if you're a professional, even the professionals are only recently like t- taking it more seriously. Yet, and mm-hmm. they should be if you're like professional. Definitely. I feel like every sport is like so that's like such a big aspect nowadays. And like, nutrition, I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. What do you what do you like a day before a competition? What are you doing? Are you training like hard or are you just kind of like relaxing and like? like letting your body rest for the next day uh they say that you should do some type of like active uh, rest so you're okay you can drill you can flow you're going like a 50 percent capacity you kind of just you're just moving you keep mm-hmm. uh and that's been i think that's what you want to do you don't want to train hard that's stupid. Mm-hmm. it's very dumb yeah um but you do want to get you don't want to do nothing either so it's right like in between it's like a deload like uh, like in powerlifting, you have deload weeks, uh, uh, where like after you peak, like after you've maxed out, you like you do like fifty percent for like a week. It seems hmm. like you're not working out at all, but when you're you're still doing the move, it's like it's better than doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, and you're still doing your movement, even though it's like fifty percent of what you potentially could do. Hmm. Interesting. So it's like it's like in in powerlifting that would be like a recovery week. Like you're maxing That's out. Recovery. You don't wanna yep. you don't wanna hurt yourself by doing that over and over so just go way lower yeah you usually do that after you've already maxed out so like, okay I've, I've maxed out for a competition like i'm now going to give my body rest by actively recovering at a much it's called a deload hmm. that's why like 
I used to see giant people come in the gym do like these puny weights, and I was like, "What are you doing? Like, why are you wasting your time?" <laughs> I was young and stupid, so I was like, "Oh, they're just like they're still teaching their the motor pattern is still there. They're still getting uh some type of exercise that is what they're 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 training for, but it's at a lower capacity." Interesting. I I've honestly never engaged with like lifting or a physical activity with this much like forethought. Like yeah, there's a lot I'm, that goes into it. <laughs> I'm literally I'm writing a joke right now. This is like something that I'm kind of proud of lately. But I I like the the premise is I think you only need to go to the gym once a week. So if you don't have time for the gym, it doesn't matter. You go once a week. You do a killer arms day, and then you get to walk around like all fucking sore for like three days, and just be like, "Yeah, I'm the strongest guy in this in every room I walk into," <laughs> just because your like body hurts. Like that's that's the whole premise. But I've never like like there's so that much that what, goes into it. That is what happens if you only train once every yeah. week. You, you yeah. always your body never acclimates and it is always exactly. each time like, ah, why did you do this to me? And that's that's like part of the joke is like, oh, you're sore because you don't do this enough. Exactly. But like yeah. the the feeling of being sore in your mind is like, oh, I'm the king of the jungle, baby. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> that's that's like so cool. I don't know. I've never that's it's so different from me like i don't know i'm very like head games like even like uh i used to boulder a lot like i used to like do some like rock climbing Mm -hmm. and what i liked about rock climbing is that it's like a body puzzle it's like you have to figure it out but it's kind of like this like oh how am i gonna shift my weight where am i gonna reach when all this stuff but I would climb like four days in a row, just maximum intensity <laughs> and just be like, oh, yeah, my body hurts for three days. I wonder why. Oh, it's because I don't like plan how to use my body at all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, boulder, rock climbing jokes. So yeah, it's like a lot of like, it's like puzzle pieces for these advanced people because they're like, oh, we all know that like we're technical or mm-hmm. have the physical capability. It's just like, how do we, how do we do this? Unless you have like random dinos that you can't like, physically do but like i think yeah yeah the dinos are tough but i don't know like bouldering was a very interesting part of my life like i think that was the only time where i had like a a physical like sport like that where i could actually feel myself like really progressing and actually like getting like stronger and just better at it i was like wow i can be coordinated i had no idea (laughs) (laughs) i know you have a good body type for like rock climbing too yeah, I got that, like, I'm getting a little fat right now. Winter in New York is tough. But, like, <laughs> but like I always thought it was funny. It's, like, the strongest guys in a rock climbing gym are built, like, marathon runners, almost. Like, they're just these, like, super sinewy, sinewy like, skinny, yeah. lanky dudes. And you're, like, oh, you just, like, only using your arms just climbed a 20-foot wall. It's incredible. <laughs> they just have, like, experienced climbers. Like, all of their strength is just, like, in their fingers and their hands. It's not even really in their arms. It's just yeah. like the things they can do with their fingers. It's it's just crazy. Yeah, I I used to like when I was doing it a lot. Like I could do probably five pull ups on like a like a door frame ledge, no problem. Like yeah. I remember seeing people do that and being like, "That's insane!" And it's like, "Oh, if you're just okay at rock climbing, that's like a normal thing you should be able to do." And if you're a regular person and you should try to do that for no reason, you'd be like, oh, wow, my fingers hurt a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, my brother and I, we took one of our friends to a, a rock climbing gym to do some bouldering. And this friend of ours, he's like really big. He's not like a power lifter, but big into weightlifting, like easily in the thousand pound club. And it was funny because he had like a lot of trouble getting up very basic like rock climbing routes because it's like all in your fingers and then you have extra yep. coordination and he goes, he was like, this 12-year-old girl has better back muscles than I do. I feel weak, and I don't like feeling weak. He's like, I go to the gym, so I don't feel weak. He's like, I could push a car sideways, but I can't climb this where this child can do this. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're, we're down to our like last 10 minutes of uh, the episode here. Um, this has been really cool. I've learned a lot there's a lot of perspective i've gained from this This is super super interesting um but i usually ask ask this question kind of at the end um during like your your journey through like martial arts and comedy and all this do you have like a message or a theme that you stick to or something you tell yourself to keep going like i feel like you had a lot of talk of discipline in this episode like what what where does that discipline come from for you 
That's a good question. Also, you just reminded me, for your premise, I think it would be funny if you just go do some finger push-ups and then you'd be like, oh, my fingers are so sore. Anyways, <laughs> uh, three yeah. days, you're like, I'm the fucking man. You see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the discipline? I don't know. That's that's probably my parents. It's probably my mom. I like a very, like, my mom's Chinese. So, mm-hmm. you know, her, her words are hurtful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, yeah, she like, I think she bred that like work ethic Mm-hmm. Which is uh I don't know pros and cons pros yeah. being that I think it's made me like work harder and be disciplined because mm-hmm. I have to do it for things I didn't enjoy doing. But the pros is that I have the ability to do it when I need to do it for things that I want to do. Right. So uh I think it's that. And then for the I think in martial arts the goal is just like I don't know at this point it's just constantly it's like you get better self improvement. I want to get better at jujitsu. It's so that keeps me going same thing with comedy like i want to get better at comedy right? mm-hmm. uh, so like the course. the joy in these things come from the self-improvement for you yeah yeah it comes from the it's like little it's like you're like you're bouldering puzzle pieces right like yeah, mine yeah it's just like i the fact that i know that i'm getting better than i was previously and then you can see that with your training partners like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm making progress making progress making progress and i think for a while for you too i like i got a little bored because like uh, the people in our gym, uh, everyone, like, it was the same people. And then we got a fresh batch of new people who were, like, world champs. And then I was like, oh, shit, I suck again. Uh, <laughs> right, let, me, let me make some progress. But for comedy, because I'm not, like, anywhere close to, like, any of that yet. I was just mm-hmm. like, all right, we're, we're on the bottom. Let's, let's, let's do as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I do think in a long term, like, your body will give up on you. So yeah. I will have to transition. That's why comedy is there. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I think most people would prefer to do something enjoyable or like a regular office job any day. So right, totally. Do you? Uh, I know. I know you have a couple jokes about jujitsu. How, how much of your written material is about jujitsu? Oh, uh, not that much, honestly. I think mm-hmm. I wrote like a, I had like three, four minutes on it, and then mm-hmm. I never wrote any more jokes because <laughs> that's it. I mean, it's like. Half of it is like orgy sex jokes, which are like relatively easy to make. And, yeah. Uh, the other half is like personal experiences that I had, which I still are think is kind of funny. So, mm-hmm. But I don't do it as often. That was like my my first set was like I talk about Magic Gathering, I talk about jujitsu, and then I talk about some of that like Tiger Mom stuff. And that was like first set I ever did, and I yeah. don't do those things as often anymore because I'm you know working on new stuff. But totally. those those are in the bank. I can I can whoop them out when I need to. <laughs> I like that. So I, I, I think it's really cool, like the what you talk about with all the discipline and stuff. Like I'm I'm like a lower work ethic individual. <laughs> <laughs> and uh meanwhile, like Lee, my my girlfriend, she's she's Chinese as well, and she's always telling me about the Chinese work ethic and stuff. And uh it's like seeing her when she really gets in the drive to like do something, really sit down and grind it out. I'm always like admiring that. And like with you just like you talking about like like I wish I had come into stand up comedy with the discipline of a previous like serious sport or activity. Like I think that's such a leg up for you because you can put yourself in the mindset of I know how long it takes to grind. I know how long it takes to achieve. I know it needs to go into that. So that's like I think that's super badass. Thanks, I think you're man, I think you're setting yourself up for a long career in both of those things. Yeah, it's probably good that I didn't start a sport with the mindset of stand-up comedy in mind. That might not go as well the other way. Because <laughs> for me, if I joined a jujitsu gym, I'd be like, all right, I know I'm going to suck at this, but if I can make the highest level dude laugh at one of my jokes, <laughs> I'm killing it. I'm killing Maybe he it. he won't kill me my next role. Maybe yeah. <laughs> I'm work my material while he's hitting. <laughs> yeah, I, I was telling people like it's messed up, but like I literally, I, I found a dentist in New York City and I... Went there and I decided to stick with them because I could make both the the secretary and the dentist laugh. And I was like, perfect. That's all I need in a dentist's <laughs> office. It's just like I need someone to laugh at my jokes while this happens. This, this is my original fans when I make a big <laughs> Exactly. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. This has been like a really cool episode. I really enjoyed all this. No, man. Thanks for having me. This was good. Of course. Uh, do you have anything you want to th- plug here at the end? I'll throw all the links or whatever you say into the episode description as well. Uh, sure. Uh, let's see, you got my Instagram, Peter Lou Comedy. Same thing on Facebook. Uh, I got my show, Comics Who Showered. That's mm-hmm. winding down because you know we're going back to real life. If you're, yeah. if you're ever in 
Boston, though. Got some outdoor mics, potentially some indoor mics coming up, but you can find all of that on the same stuff. So, Oh, I'm also on Twitter. I don't post a lot of stuff on Twitter because I don't like... My jokes suck on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> that's a that's a new thing you have to discipline yourself at is getting good at yeah. Twitter. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah, it's a whole different <laughs> I could talk. I could do a full ninety minute episode with someone just about Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and then another ninety on TikTok. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's it for today as today's episode, guys. Uh, Peter, thanks again for coming on. This was dope. Um, any listeners, go go try out jujitsu. Go get your ass kicked. Go get some. Uh, go let someone try out their moves on you. <laughs> there you go. Go be a go be a crazy for a little bit. Yeah, uh, one of the crazies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, yeah. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks again for being on here, Peter. Great talk. And uh, I will uh, talk to you all, guys, next week. Bye.